Welcome to the second episode of Chaos Orchestra, Natural Language Understanding, the probably ultimate test for artificial intelligence. Asimov's first law of robotics says, do no harm to humans. But how would you ensure that a machine actually understands what we mean, but not harming a human? Would we train it on a billion of examples? And even if we would, how would we make sure that it's aware of all the nuances and all the ethical requirements that we have? Despite deep learning, having achieved superior results in solving classification problems or playing close world games. It still made nearly no progress in the last 20 years in some other fields. Problems that require abstraction, generalization, explainability, data efficiency, integration of prior knowledge or open world inferencing and modeling unstable environments are still big weaknesses of deep learning. And it seems like the AI community is at a crossroads on how to approach this problem. The deep learning community claims that with more compute and more data, they would be able to solve all of these problems and they do not necessarily need to imitate the human way of abstracting as machines do it themselves in some or another way. It's just not accessible to us yet. On the other side, there is the semantic AI community that tries to integrate common sense knowledge as a basis or a framework for future deep learning algorithms to train on. There are quite a few companies working on a hybrid approach. An example would be IBM's Neurosymbolic AI that uses semantic approaches in order to understand the decomposed natural language questions that they later answer with AI systems. Or Google search engine that is powered by a knowledge graph. Or even AlphaGo that uses Monte Carlo tree search. Scientists like Gary Marcus or Walid Saba claim that in order to reach artificial general intelligence, it is crucial to integrate prior common sense knowledge. Today, we're going to explore if building cognitive models and integrating common sense knowledge into artificial systems is actually an efficient and effective approach. Obviously, this common sense knowledge would need to be machine readable and machine interpretable in order to provide value. I'm very excited to talk to Walid Saba today since he spent multiple decades in research of natural language understanding and artificial intelligence systems. And he has very strong opinions on what approaches might work and which won't. Walid is very direct and very interesting to talk to. I hope you enjoy the conversation as much as I did. Walid, why is natural language understanding such an ultimate test for artificial intelligence? Yeah, that's a good question. And uh, actually, in my uh, about 200 years ago, in my thesis, uh, I started with uh, that I think Alan Turing was a genius, not only obviously in his contribution to computation, but he was visionary uh, in seeing that language is the ultimate test. Now, I don't know if he thought about it the way I think about it, but Look, I mean, take uh, take other species on, on planet Earth, right? They almost do everything we do except what? Language. Uh, pattern recognition, image recognition. I mean, we celebrated ImageNet. Wow, we can recognize a cat from a dog. So can elephants. I mean, big deal, right? So actually some animals have better pattern recognition than us. Uh, eagles uh, see a fish in the sea two miles away. I mean, uh, some animals have a hearing uh, capability. They even hear the vibrations before it comes. So language is the beast. Language is the ultimate test. Why? Because language and thought go together. It's the only if. So thinking is language. Language is the mind, right? So, and if you dig deeper into all the issues involved in language, you end up doing really, I mean, the philosophy of language is the philosophy of mind. You, you get into reasoning, cognition, representation, common sense. All of that is language. Language is not just the text we see outside. Language is thinking. We think in language. Of course, we think in an internal language. We don't think in the external. Uh, so that's why language. Language is the key to the mind. Uh, pattern recognition. Yeah, it's a good skill. I mean, it's better than tables. Tables don't do pattern recognition. But uh, rats do and uh, birds do. I mean, so that's not intelligence, right? We know animals are not intelligent in the, in the sense of human intelligence, reasoning and inference and problem solving. So that's why it's language. Language is the key to the mind, at least in my opinion. Anything else? I know some, some people 
one big question people ask is why not games? Let's say. I mean, playing chess, you know, the folk psychology, the, the people uh, like uh, your grandma, if you play good chess, she says, uh, brilliant, he's good at chess, right? He's a good chess player, that means he's smart. Not really. Game playing is a brute force. Uh, some people have that skill. It's like some people have skill multiplying and, and dividing 12-digit uh, numbers. Uh, th these are skills, right? So game playing is a brute force. If I go and score all the boards, I'm going to beat the hell out of you. That's it. It's, it's a very mechanical thing. Now, very few people have the ability to see 10 boards look ahead. So they're not good as someone else in chess, but uh, it, it's not about the mind. So it's language in my mind. And that's why I got stuck with language. I got addicted to it because it's a, it's an opening to many other fields. By the way, in AI, if you work in any other subfield, you can narrow it down to one. In language, you have to get into linguistics, psychology, cognitive science, philosophy, logic, cognitive science because language is part of all of those. So obviously when we're talking about AI, we're talking about trying to mimic human AI, right? It's not that other animals maybe are not, not intelligent at all, right? There's, there's octopus maybe, you know, who can camouflage their skin and all these things. Uh, but these are survival things. These are not, I mean, look, you can get the biggest beast on earth into a cage with a banana. I mean, animals are not intelligent in the human sense. They have survival instincts, yes. They have enough, they evolve with enough intelligence to survive, and that's it. Uh, and experiments have been done on animal intelligence. I mean, this is not, uh, I'm not inventing anything. So, uh, and even animal language, which is like a hash table, it's a finite set. They have, uh, and there, there's no composition, there's no constituency. That's the big thing. In, so it's all blobs, like I have this sound and it means this. The sound guys means this, okay? Like, uh, means, come on, let's go. And that's it. They have a limited vocabulary that was discovered, and it's, uh, there's no constituents. Like, there are no primitives where they can do computation and permutation. There's no language. You know, it's like a, it's a hash table. We have these sounds, and they mean this. Okay, guys? That's it. That's not a language. That's a communication coding scheme. Uh, very fun, right? Uh, and their intelligence has been proven to be very limited. They are like one level. They cannot even do three level reasoning. Like if this, then this, it's this, then let's deduce this. They've done experiments. They're very reactive. This happened, I usually do this. That's it. Before, after, consequences, implication. The language is a sign or a natural language is a sign of intelligence. Um, I mean, it might as well be a survival skill for, for humans, right? But what is it, intelligence? Yeah, it, it is in many ways. Uh, language, by the way, without language, we would not have evolved. I mean, uh, we would not have probably survived. There are many psycholinguists that say, uh, like, imagine uh, without communication, without communicating thoughts and thus converting thoughts from uh, transferring thought uh, knowledge from one generation. I mean, before the written word, before we wrote things and scribbled on walls and stuff, the way we transferred knowledge is through communication, right? If we didn't have language, probably we wouldn't have survived. I mean, so at some point, the Homo sapiens, something happened. Now, I, I, I'm not uh, well versed in the biology and evolution of language, but uh, there's a sort of an agreement that there was a spark, something happened at some point and it's usually around a thousand years give or take they discovered that when language came you started seeing signs of intelligence like tools people started to be smart make sharp tools for hunting instead of beating uh, the hell out of the deer until it died so they made sharp tools they made uh, yeah, uh, utensils at home so it came with intelligence language so something happened right some spark one line of homo sapiens survived and that's the one that at that point developed language and thought thinking came with language uh so yeah it, it, many say without language we wouldn't have survived uh, and actually there's a lot of uh, efficiency in language it's it's related to computational theory by the way to complexity 
there are people that studied concepts and the notion of a hierarchy and, and the difference between objects and concepts, instances, as you want, and classes. Like, uh, we wouldn't have survived, literally. I mean, imagine if you, uh, if you burn your hand on an oven, right, when you're a kid. You learn that when I can't put my hand on fire because it will burn me and that causes pain, blah, blah, blah. But you didn't learn that it's this oven only that burns. You generalized into all the concepts. I mean, imagine if we didn't have concepts and you have to learn from each oven. Do you know what I'm saying? Like if you, if you, if our learning was limited to instances, we can't even generalize the concepts. I would have to burn my hand on all ovens until I know. Like I, I don't have the notion of a general class. So co concepts and generalization was a, we couldn't survive without them. If I had to uh, cross the street and hit, uh, be hit by a car 200 times until I generalize, literally we would not have evolved. We would not have survived. So generalization and cognition and language uh, or we would have been like uh, the, the other primates on earth. We would have been animals and, and an elephant can trick us and we would have been dumb beasts, basically. So we're not just primitively learning based on statistics and tests. How do we learn then? Not everything we know, we learn, okay? The, the idea here is about knowledge, right? We, learning is overrated in AI now that everything I know it's uh, popular amongst people because how do you know stuff? We learn, right? So it comes with folk psychology, with uh, with uh, mom and dad and, and the next door neighbor. They say, oh, we learn stuff. Well, that's the folk meaning of learning, but the technical meaning is not true at all. Actually, all the things that matter in the world, we don't learn. All right, let, let, me, let me explain that. Yeah, please. We, 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 yeah, we learn skills. You mentioned the guitar. I learned, I tried to learn how to play guitar. Right? So I play guitar and Jimi Hendrix used to play guitar. Obviously, we both play guitar, but you know, you don't want to listen to me and you can't stop listening to Hendrix or, or David Gilmour, right? Okay, so we both play guitar. We both learn. Learning is gradual. Learning is personal. So you learn to ride a bike, I learn to ride a bike, you learn to drive sports cars, I learn to drive, you drive different from me, I, and there are grades, right? And so there are many properties of learning. It's individual, there's no yes or no. There's like, ah, oh, he's almost there, right? There's no, he knows how to play guitar or he knows how to, well, he's there, or, right? So learning is fuzzy, it's personal, and it's not necessary. I don't need to play guitar. Now, let's go to knowledge. This is what we learn. We learn skills. Yeah, we learn to recognize objects, right? Well, that's learning, right? I'll give them that. But I don't learn that two plus two is four. I am told. Because if I learn two plus two is, if, if we learn arithmetic and you learn arithmetic, then we could learn it differently. So proof by contradiction, because we're not allowed to learn it differently, it is not learned. We are taught by instruction, by teachers, by reading it somewhere, or if you're lucky, by discovering it yourself and telling the whole world. Right? So knowledge, all the stuff that really matters in the world, because it doesn't matter if I play guitar or not, or I ride a bicycle or not to the universe, like big deal. The things that matter in the world, we don't learn. We are taught by instruction by deduction, by discovery. Sometimes we stumble on new knowledge by accident. So many scientists discover things by accident. But knowledge is not learned. That's ridiculous. If knowledge is learned, then individual people will learn differently and we will never agree on anything. And planes will crash and bridges will fall and two plus two sometimes is six. Like what? No, 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 no. The word is more systematic than this, guys. The word is not all probability and flip a coin. And this is ridiculous. You do that when you don't know anything. You say, okay, to replace the complete ignorance, you make some statistical approximation, just so that at least I have something to go on. But, the, but science doesn't work this way. The goal is to find that thing, which is binary, true or false, done. So learning is overrated, first of all. And there's a misconception that knowledge, like we're gonna create intelligence by just looking at stuff. Are you crazy? 
humans, if that's what they did, a child will have to be 80 years old before they can cross the street or say a single sentence. No, that's not how it's like by show me more stuff and then I'll become intelligent. We, we would die before we can do anything reasonable. We, we don't have time to learn all this stuff. Plus, as a paradigm, it's not true. Logic says, if you, if you, if you learn stuff, and I learn stuff, because of our different individual experiences, we might learn it differently. Because most, not most, all knowledge cannot be learned differently. These are facts. Thoughts, they are not learned. Proof by contradiction. Done. Like I said, what we learn is not the recognition stuff, skills. Okay. I learn how to, you know, uh, climb the uh, 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 mountains. I learn how to uh, wrestle. I learn how to, I don't know, in my case, I learn how to uh, try to, to play guitar or paint. Okay, we learn, we try to learn. And we learn them differently and they're fuzzy, they're individual. These are, this is where learning is. But all that, oh, but all that stuff doesn't matter, by the way, to the whole world. Doesn't like the, the universe doesn't care if I know how to play guitar or not. But the universe will not function the same way if the circumference of a circle is not two pi r. And that's not up to me. That's knowledge. That's not learned. I did not sense by experience. I stared at a circle and said, you know what? It's a uh, two pi pi being three point one four blah blah blah. And I discovered by sensing and by learning and by observation that that's the circumference of a no. By deduction, by formulation, by by, uh, we discovered, we discovered. Well, to be to be the devil's advocate here, yeah, um, sure. AI systems usually have much better hardware than humans, right? They're able to process more data. And isn't knowledge maybe all this all these patterns consolidated together and maybe abstracted? Can we deduce knowledge from from huge amounts of data like GPT three tries to do and Bird and all this all these things? Yeah. Look, uh, uh, lots of data uh, or little data, it's not the volume. Uh, that's uh, another misconception. I can learn from, uh, because, oh, okay, let me put it this way. So maybe it's it just is. a different strategy to reach the same result. Because we don't need the data, but maybe we can reach with huge amounts of data uh, the result we have. Right. Uh, the, my my answer is no, but I want to justify it and be more polite because just saying no is not my. Okay. Uh, no, we, we, knowledge cannot. You, you're, we're not going to discover knowledge that matters from data, not at all. Why? Here is why. If uh, first of all, there are domains that are infinite. Actually, most domains that matter are infinite. Uh, so, how much data? One billion data points, one trillion data. I mean, now GPT three. Actually, now there's a there's someone that says one up on you, double or nothing. Now uh, there's a they make GPT three now sound silly. They went to trillions of them. And it's like okay, and then what, right? Because trillion over infinity, guess is what zero. Trillion over infinity equals two over infinity. So whether you process two or trillion, guess what? When it comes to language you're both predicting with zero, with zero. Noam Chomsky said it years ago, nobody knew what he's talking about. I, I'm not a Chomsky in, in, in the bigger sense of the linguistic stuff. I agree with many things he said, who I like to agree with him. He's a brilliant uh, cognitive scientist slash philosopher, you name it. But he said uh, years ago to speaking of Predicting the next sentence with any meaningful probability is a meaningless notion. By meaningless notion, he's saying it, it, it doesn't make sense to even speak of it, let alone compute it and 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 try to make try to uh, replace it with understanding. Are you nuts? How, how can you predict what I'm going to say next? This is like trying to predict. Not like it is exactly like trying to predict the thought I'm going to have next because the next sentence is a translation of the thought I'm going to have. So it's meaningless, no matter how much you process, right? Okay. Now, the biggest problem of all of that is the information you need to understand language is not even in the data. So even if 
I'll, I'll get to I'll get to that. So you're uh, basically uh, you're going into a dark room looking for an elephant. If it's dark, you will keep this hope alive that maybe the elephant is here. But you should have some lights because there is no elephant. You're looking in the wrong room. If you put aside the fact that language is infinite, and no matter how many patterns you see, the next thing that someone is going to say is something you never saw, because the combinations infinite. You know what infinity is. Forget it, right? I can change one preposition or change the A to the or put it the old. I mean, the combinatorics are infinite. If you take that aside and you say, let's limit our language, although we wouldn't have survived, which is like you want to create a new, okay, if you want to create a new universe with dumb robots, and okay, you can have dumb language understanding. But the fact that uh, the data you're looking for in the understanding part is not even in the data. No matter, let's say you can process infinity. I'm going to give you a theoretical leeway that defies mathematics. You are going to reach infinity. Even if you process every linguistic utterance that was said, and that will be said, so you conquered infinity. What you're looking for in terms of language understanding is not in that body of it's not in the data that you're reading. There's a part that we use in language understanding, we humans, that we call background knowledge, that, that little bit of stuff that we share. So everything we write is compressed. We write all the stuff that is needed to convey our thoughts, but no more, because I assume you have the rest. So the rest is not in the text. It's not there. Forget it. Assuming you can process infinity, which on its own is ridiculous. But even if you can, you're looking for something that's not there. The remaining stuff that we need for the full understanding is in our head. And that's why it's difficult for a machine. Because when a machine looks at a sentence, it doesn't know what's missing and what the one who wrote it assumed I also know. And the machine is looking like, you're assuming I know something else, but I don't. I'm a dumb machine. And that's why NLU is difficult by machines. For humans, it's not a problem because I know what you know, even if I don't know you, by the way, and even if you speak a different language, because the common background knowledge is language agnostic, culture agnostic. It's about, we both know trees don't fly. We both know elephants don't, uh, uh, don't uh, swim or whatever. We, we all know. Uh, basic stuff that's culture independent, language independent. So that's why we communicate and we leave many stuff out because I know you know the rest. You're a human being like me. Uh, so you must have that extra stuff. That extra stuff, we never say it. So it's not even in the text. You're looking for something that's not there. End of story. So uh, learning should should happen based on, on prior knowledge. Is that what you're saying? In my mind, learning should happen where learning uh, works. Learning works and like, okay, you want to teach a robot how to walk, that's learning, oh, or how to dance. Even walking comes uh, with a lot of innate stuff, by the way. Uh, I don't know if you look at the calf, uh, when a cow gives birth, the young calf take two, three minutes and they start walking and going around. Nobody teaches them. There's a lot of stuff that comes innate, even in animals. Learning what? And, and the calf needs to be told what to eat if they got hungry. No, they, they go start grazing. They're like one hour old. But, and children. Learning should be applied to things like finding patterns in data. So, for example, analytics. Okay, that's a good place for it. You know, okay. Uh, tons of data, find some patterns, do some predictions based on historical data. Excellent. You know, uh, back in the days, it used to be called data mining. Okay, but if you have a good hammer, you don't comb your head with it, your hair, right? It's a good tool, but it should be used where it's good. Learning, finding patterns in data, fine. But to assume that this small paradigm of figuring out from tons of data what patterns I have will explain cognition and the mind and the way we think, are you crazy? And there's ample proof that this is not learned. There's something else happening. There's a and there's a lot of proof. By the way, there are two papers that just came out. Well, one of them uh, a while back, 
and one just recently by almost everybody at Google, like the first page is all the authors, uh, on uh, under specification. I'm, I'm, I'm in the progress of writing something about that. Because in on my blog, I've, I've hinted at these things, but informally. And now they're formally proven. Two different papers. One talks about the notion of adversarial examples. You know, on neural networks, you can easily attack a, any model. It doesn't matter the topology of the network or or uh, how uh, or what, what activation from number of layers. Blah, blah, blah. It doesn't matter the model. You can attack it, and we got to a point where we can attack any net network with one pixel and make it uh, see a bus as a raccoon. It's that ridiculous. And technically, actually, it's easy. I, I, I can explain how it's done, more or less. Uh, but recently, there's a great paper that came out that explains what's happening. You can attack any network because, okay, intuitively, well, not technically. Here's the thing. Let's stick to images. If you take the image of a sheep and an image of a dog, mm -hmm. there are some images where if you if you hide just the significant features that make a dog dog and just look at the fluffy body and all of it and the fluffy body of the sheep, they almost look the same. So 90% of the images of the two images of a sheep and a white dog are almost the same, except like okay, that like only 10% are relevant features. They have to do with rules, like, uh, but the big blob of data is almost equivalent if you look at the larger image, right? Okay, let me make it more, uh, a, 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 a tennis ball and an orange. I mean, virtually they're the same, except there's one spot in the orange that says this is an orange. Because, and that's word knowledge, because you don't see this in a tennis ball. What these people found out, and it's brilliant, and it's related to, then I'll mention the under specification. What they found out is the network tries to optimize, it doesn't care about relevant, not relevant, important uh, feature or not. It just, it needs any help it can get. So it tries to optimize by minimizing the error and it doesn't care what it's using. So it's happy to get to a point where there's no error, but what it learned is more than it should. It, 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 so the orange is an orange, but probably so is a tennis ball and so, right? So now what they found out is that there are very few features that are important. And actually the majority are not. And that's how people attack this network. They say 90% of your data is garbage actually. Right, so I can attack you anywhere. I can always give you data that will produce the class I want. I optimize in reverse, basically, because in a neural network you have two uh, two knowns and one unknown. The known is the input and the label. That's how you train it. For this data, you say that's the output that I want, and you can and you keep going back and forth until the weights predict everything with a good error rate. Attacking it is in reverse. Attacking it, you know the weights and you know the output. I want to, I want you to classify an orange. I know what your weights are. I will find an input that will make you think it's an orange. So it's the same process in reverse and it's solvable because again, I have two knowns and one unknown. I can always solve it. I can always attack any neural network and make you think a bus is a fridge. Okay. So these guys found out the reason this happened. Actually, the title of the paper is going to be The Unrelenting Ghost of Porter and Frege. Guys, you should have read Frege very well. Go back and read it. This was predicted years ago. The reason the attack can happen is you can't just take data, blobs of data, and find patterns. Even that for cognition is not good. It's good in data analytics where it's good. That's it. But for reasoning and classification, even in images, even error prone which is your claim to fame. Even there, you can't protect an attack. And the reason is you need other information than just the data. You need human, they call it human bias, which means we're not. You need to be told when you look at a ball or an orange, the million pixels are important, but this one is a lot more important because that's what makes an orange an orange. 
Now, the other big, and this is a very, very good result because it formalizes the intuition some of us had long time ago. The other big result, and they're related, is called the problem of underspecification. Under specification, they say there's there seems to be every time we build a model, we have good prediction, even on the test data, blah, blah, blah. We put it in the real world and it screws up. They said the thing that what's happening is uh, every time the model generates a, a function that predicts all the data correctly, it actually chose one of these predictors out of many others that could have covered the data also successfully. So it's underspecified. In other words, there is not only one solution to cover all the data correctly, there are many. And so, and the, and the network has no way of knowing which is better. What's happening here is the same as the adversarial problem, although they're looking at it as two different problems. They are the same problem. You need more constraints to tell the learner that when, when yes, this function also covers all the data. You can always have a pattern that covers all the data, right? Function that covers all of them, right? There's another one that covers all of them, but this represents the knowledge that you need. In other words, you need more constraints. Uh, let me give a real example that Fodor used years ago. Let's say your function outputs 10, right? Uh, well, uh, 10 can cover so many data points. This, the input space could be huge. It could be 3 times 2 plus 4. That's 10. Could be 0 plus 0 plus 0 plus 0 plus 10. Obviously, the set is infinite. Okay, so there are many solutions that cover the output 10. Can I constrain it a little bit? Well, yes. If I tell you, okay, okay, but my data has to be only two inputs. Oh, all of a sudden, a set of possible uh, data points that can give me 10, it's still not uh, finite. It's still not uh, one, but it's much less than before. Now, if I tell you the composition operation between them is addition. Oh, so now I'm telling you that I arrived at 10, but at 10, if I have two objects and one operator, so now I'm limited to two things and I can fix the operator, it must be addition. Now the possible inputs are simple, six, four, because the only thing I can do is have two things and add two, eight, eight, two, okay. But first I had an infinite one, okay. And I can even fix it more. Say uh, the first one has to be smaller than the second. All of a sudden there are only three possibilities or whatever. The point is, under specification means you you have a final value, but you could have arrived at it in so many ways. Uh, what's missing is structure. Is is intentional? Are call them constraints. So you basically would need to. And which means which means there's no escape in reasoning. There's no escape uh, the the curse of Jerry Fodor. You need con symbolic constraints. You need if then else, and I need this followed by this. You need structure. Uh, the word I use for it is intention. You need, it's like an adversarial example. Take all of these things, but if it has this, remember there's word knowledge. There's, otherwise, you're taking data points, billions of them, and saying, I found a function that covers them. So I can always give you another data points that will fool your function and you think I have the data you expect. They just realized these two big problems that will be a dead end for deeper. And both of them, I have to work a little bit more on the paper, but both of them reduce to, you need another set of constraints to limit what you're predicting to a, a meaningful input. Otherwise, this input also looks like uh, it's good for you. And so is this. And so is this. Uh, I don't know if I proved it. Uh, I, I explained it technically, but these two big phenomena are now stopping the, the, the deep learning models of today from being deployed in serious places where you have life or death or you're trying to make big decisions. Or if you're doing image retrieval on the net, who cares if you 
you know, uh, you get images that just look, sometimes you get them because the colors look the same. They have nothing to do with the, or you're doing search and you're using, uh, or you're doing, uh, yeah, search or translation. And it gives you an idea of what's going on. But you can't use this technology seriously because you have to go back to symbolic reasoning. So we basically, we basically have to put the AI systems of the way to understand natural language into primary school, to college, and because we are not learning this knowledge we're taught. So, I mean, there are concepts to do that, right? We can provide taxonomy, some knowledge for apps that have some of the symbolic knowledge. But, uh, I mean, this is not a scalable thing to do, right? You, you cannot have a domain expert for every domain and model it out for... Right, right. That, right. But, okay, here, here's my comment. Why do you need a domain expert for language? Have you seen four-year-olds uh, talk? Do, do you think they have any domain knowledge of anything? They can barely open the door. But, but I'm always amazed when it comes to language. People say, but you need all this knowledge. What do you think a three-year-old or a four-year-old knows? They know nothing. They're human idiots walking barely. I said to my, my son when he was then, open the door. It takes them five hours. They don't know how to turn the knob on. What? What do you mean all this knowledge? What do, what do kids have in terms of knowledge? Nothing. They don't have accounting or chemistry. Or they don't have nothing. They don't know anything. They, they're dumb babies, but they talk forever. Language understanding doesn't need any domain knowledge. Zero. We have existential. This is called existential proof. It's the simplest proof technique in the history of science. Proof by existence. Look at any three-year-old. They have no domain knowledge whatsoever they hardly have word knowledge by the way they still don't know word knowledge but once that spark of language kicks you can't stop them okay so we're not giving the system domain knowledge so it can understand text in a specific domain but we're trying to explain how language works but language is infinite right so right uh well there's something called recursion that explain that defines any infinite object in a finite way there's a there's a nice book that talks about the recursive mind we definitely use recursion. And that's when I was talking about animal cognition. I said, that's what they miss, finite. Infinity always plays in in cognition. Every time you go somewhere, infinity is a big factor. And that was part of the genius of the human mind. Somewhere we developed this recursive structure, this recursive mind, where we can deal with infinite objects in a finite way. Recursion is one way. Yes, language is infinite, but the knowledge you need for language it's not infinite. Actually, it turns out to be very small, at least in the findings I found out that I'm working on now. Uh, and again, it makes sense because I know what my kids at four year old knew. They, they hardly knew anything. Uh, but but they talk, man. They, they, once they talk, you can't stop on any subject. And if they don't know a domain specific thing, which has nothing to do with language, that's now domain expertise. It's not about language understanding. They tell you, oh, I don't know much about that guy, right? So the language competency is there. Uh, yeah, if I talk to them and at that age about physics, they will tell me, Dad, I don't know physics. But language-wise, forget it. Uh, or it doesn't have to be your kid. I mean, I don't know how it happens to me all the time. I bump into a kid in a museum. She's a three, four-year-old. My God, I had conversations for an hour. I don't even know her. She hardly knows anything. She doesn't know who I am. But we talk. So I don't know where people come from saying it, but you need all this knowledge. Ooh, ooh, we can't do it, you know. We have to learn it. What? Have you talked to a four-year-old? What do they know? Nothing. Hardly anything. Now, people speak of evolution, that, uh, that all the stuff is, is already uh, innate in their brain. Uh, and that's what learning is trying to simulate trying to simulate 200,000 years of evolution. Like, take this, take that. Right. Yeah, uh, no, no, language is, because my, my, my interest is in language. Now, if you want to go into problem solving and planning and autonomous vehicle and reasoning and, uh, and uncertain and dynamic environments and decision support systems and that stuff, yeah, that requires domain-specific knowledge. Uh, but my concern is language, language understanding. The stuff we do every day when we bump into strangers and, you know, we talk, we make a conversation. I'm simplifying it as difficult as it is, but that's my humble goal. And for that, 
learning is almost irrelevant, by the way. I know I'm saying an extreme word. Not only it will not help or it needs uh, improvement, blah, blah, blah. It's not even relevant. You're barking down the wrong tree completely. It's So in my mind, it's a complete waste of resources and time. Remains to be proven. Uh, I hope this is recorded. One day someone will look at it and say he was right. This approach has nothing to do with language. Not only it will take time or it needs a, there's something missing and just if we add this and it will work, it's irrelevant, complete waste of time. Okay, so it's like uh, it's like using uh, uh, using a lift truck to go to the moon. It, it, it's not relevant, right? It's just you're doing something that doesn't, it's not even applicable. Right? I'm not talking about text processing. In text processing, you can use machine learning because they're all some form of compression and I'm, take, I'm taking a big blob of text and generating some key phrases or a summary. I'm compressing data, so that's fine. But language understanding, forget. Uh, so yeah, whether it's GPT-3 or there will be GPT-20 even. They're, they're not going, it's irrelevant, has nothing to do with language understanding. By, uh, by, by, by mathematical reasoning, I mean, it's not like my intuitive feeling. I looked at these models, I tried them. Uh, they're, they're just pattern recognizers. They have nothing to do with understanding. Uh, and there's ample proof. I mean, but it, it, it requires uh, going through some. So my concern is language, doesn't need too much knowledge. It's about figuring out what is that structure that seems to be underneath language. So the, the structure we're born with, what is it? Is it this understanding of causality and recursion and all these things? I'm talking explicitly about that little structure that, that seems to constrain language in terms of, look, every utterance we say, technically speaking, can have anywhere from 30 to 40 possible meanings. If you count all the permutations, like uh, the different meanings words can have and the different syntactic structures a sentence can have, the different quantifiers, scope ordering, the different uh, prepositional phrase attachments, like uh, I ate pizza with pineapple as opposed to I ate pizza with a fork. Right? I don't put fork as a topping. Right? So, so all these things, all these different combinations, if you count them and you have to multiply them by each other, it's a, uh, so it becomes like a factorial. It's like, but amazingly enough, as almost real time, as you speak, real time, from all these forty possible thoughts you're trying to convey, I really figure out which one you're trying to say. It's amazing. It's almost real time before you finish your speech. From these forty possible meanings, I know what you mean because I know the rest that's in your head and that's my in my head is the same. We have the same common, we call it common base. So like we're always speaking with the same common base, whether we know it or not, because how the word works and how, like what we know about tables and uh, walls, and, uh, it's the same. So I immediately figure out what you're saying. That is because we have that common structure. That's the structure I'm talking about. That's the key. Now, of course, there are other key operations like uh, the the primitives inside are not language specific. That there's no English or Chinese or German inside. There's a there's a set of primitives that are universal, set of cognitive primitives that are universal. Some of them are well known, like the idea of uh, the idea of part of, right? Even a three year old early on, and that's what kids spend the first three years on, by the way. Uh, bootstrapping these primitives, that there's the notion of containment, something inside of something. Uh, the notion of uh, generalization, that seems that something that looks like an orange and an apple, and we call all these things fruit. Uh, so the notion of is a subtype, the notion of part of, the notion of agent, like there's some activity and someone is doing that activity, right? John is dancing. There is some dancing going on, and the age of the subject of the dancing is John. The idea that objects have properties, that's also universal in any culture. Uh, like uh, any physical object has size and has color. So these are universal primitives that have nothing to do with any language. 
So there's that structure, that common structure, and these primitives. That's language. And when we have a thought, we make it out of these two. And then we spit it out in English. Someone spits it out in uh, Finnish or Japanese. Or and it, it can't be that difficult. Why? Because three-year-olds do it perfectly well. So to tell me that I have to read two billion documents to somehow discover how we understand language from text that most of the knowledge that is is uh, trying to imply is not in the text. What are you doing? So, if language was finite, okay, so then that's a big, a huge table, you know, big, big dictionary, fuzzy table, lookup table, and we put every possible sentence and what it means, and we're done. So every time someone says something, I go to the hash table, pick it up, and I understand what it means. Like, uh, unfortunately, intelligence is about. Uh, from all the possible alternatives, somehow humans, they go from the probable to possible and immediately figure out the most plausible in a fraction of a nanosecond. That's the most plausible. That's what. That's the one that makes more sense according to what we all know. That's intelligence. If it's all about a lookup table, there's no thinking. Fine. I have everything. Which one do you want? This one? No thinking, take it. But the genius of a human, a human being is there are infinite number of possibilities. But I always know which one makes more sense. Same in planning. Yeah. So, so if it's a finite list of these primitives, can we describe them in, in ontology? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can I just named four or five. I just named four or five, like. Agent, subject of a relation, that's that's a universal primitive. Every culture, every every human being knows the that in some relation there's a subject that's doing the thing and there's an object that the thing is being done to. So that that is a cognitive primitive. It's not English, it's not Chinese, it's not right. Uh, the notion that objects have properties, the notion that objects uh, 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 that uh, objects can be in a containment relationship, objects can be in, that events have a sequence. We know that something happens before something, uh, which translates into language like, here's an example. Uh, John McCarthy uh, uh, gave a speech at AAAI. He received an amazing uh, welcome, right? We know that he received an amazing welcome before the speech. So we know that if these two events happen, no matter how we mention them, this happened before this. So because we know that certain events have an order, they might overlap, but there might be a, one that is completely before the other. These are the cognitive primitives. And then we have this ontological structure where we know a car is a vehicle and vehicles are artifacts and artifacts are made and they are made by people. Trees don't make cars. So the make relationship makes sense or applies to objects that are by human and any other artifact. So it makes sense to say X made Y when X is a human. Well, maybe animals. Animals make things. So we'll have to go a level up. Uh, but animals don't make what we really call artifacts. It's a different make. And that's why you have ambiguity, but that's fine. You don't have another, you have make one, make two. That's it, that's what's underneath language. And then there's a system that uses these things in the process of uh, what we call understanding. But the amazing thing is it happens so quickly, so fast. I mean, you're saying something that could mean 30, 40 things at the least. And almost real time, whether I'm hearing it or reading it, before even I finished, I figured out that that's the thought you're trying to convey out of all these possibilities. Can we capture that, this knowledge in an ontology? Yes, of course. Um, and another thing about this ontology, that, that, and that should tell you if you, if you have the right one for language, uh, if you have the right one or not, that ontology has to be discovered again, not invented. Now, what do I mean by that? Anything that can be invented can be invented in so many ways. I mean, we could have made cars different. And actually, every few years, we make them different. 
but what you discover, you have no choice. You're trying to discover what's there. You're not making it. You're discovering. It's like archaeologists. We have to dig and find out what's underneath our language. So it's not up to us to create the structure. And many people went wrong in symbolic AI, by the way, because they tried to play this game. They acted like God. So you have someone, I think the world is structured this way. Who told you? And you have someone else saying, but I have my ontology. And for me, that's how the world is. So all of that, and I talked about this years ago. You guys are playing God. I mean, you, want, you think you, it, you have to discover it. You can't engineer the common ontology that underlies all humans. Not, all, not only English. All humans. They have evolved with this innate structure that you have to discover. It's not up to you. You have to dig and find out how the hell does the structure look. Now, people tell me, how do you do that? There are ways. What is the best model of that structure? Language. So you reverse engineer language. Basically, language. Okay, language is the best manifestation of that model, right? Every day spoken language. Not machine readable, right? No, no, that's fine. Even if you do it, uh, even if you do it analytically, like uh, conceptual analysis, like you take you take how we speak, reverse engineer it. You discover what this, the way we speak. You discover what we as, what are the assumptions that are implicit in the way we speak. I'll give you an example, a very simple. Example. If I say, take a very innocent word, is, in English. It's the copula, formally speaking. I can say, uh, William H. Barney is Billy the Kid. Here is, is the ism of identity, that this is the same as this. Or JFK is uh, John Fitzgerald Kennedy. And here I'm saying this is, this object is that I just discovered equality. I just discovered that underneath language, there's a primitive that is assumed in language, that in our ordinary language, it's assumed we have the notion of equality in our head. We just discovered the first primitive, the first cognitive primitive, equality. Let's do something else. Uh, Sarah is a dancer. Now is, is between an object and what? An activity, right? So now I discovered there's something which is an activity and objects can be the agent of that activity. I just discovered another primitive. Without making a long story, without making a short story long, if we analyze language, if we analyze how we speak, we can discover when we speak, what we are, what are we assuming? It's, it's called reverse engineering. Language is the model of what we have. So reverse engineering, it will give you a lot of hints as to what's inside. And it will turn out to be a lot simpler than people thought, by the way, which is consistent with Occam's razor. Uh, how many primitives and, are there? Probably less than 100. Actually, a lot less. Something like 70 uh, will be the maximum. And the ontological structure I'm talking about, which is, uh, is no more than 2,000 types. Yeah. So it's something you uh, Yeah, yeah, it's it's right. a, it, and and people tell you, but there's you need so much knowledge. Excuse me? Have you talked to a, a dumb three year old? They have no knowledge, they don't know anything. But they know part of, they know, you know, next to, besides, they know this stuff. Okay. By the way, <laughs> when I say ontological types, People use the word ontology now. I'm, I'm using it in the formal, logical way, meta, the metaphysics of things, what's out there. Uh, ontologically speaking, most of the things we refer to in our world are not real, genuine ontological categories. There are instances. So when I said 2,000, each leaf has 100,000 instances. So the concepts we think of them are, are not real concepts. They are instances. The real categories are very, very few. And there is a criteria to test if it's a, they call this the knowledge level. Then you have the information level, then you have the data level where you actually go and see them. 
and each one of them has a different weight and a different actual size. And that's the data level. That's the raw signals, the raw data. But the ontological categories are very few. Very, very few. I mean, again, look at a three-year-old. And, and the, the, another misconception is language is ambiguous. If I count every time I heard that, I, and I was given a penny for each time I heard that, I'll be a billionaire. Every time I talk about language, people say, but language is ambiguous. No, no, no. Excuse me. How, how many times in today people stop you and say, wait, what do you mean? This rarely happens when we are on purpose vague or we are trying, or we assume that they heard the previous thing and we missed it. But this is rare. We don't stop each other and say, what do you mean? We know what we mean. Language is not ambiguous. I mean, I don't know why we're in science. Sometimes we create this, uh, these uh, mysteries and we believe them. Language is ambiguous. Don't you do scientific observation? How many times people stop you and said, what do you mean? Rarely, maybe three times in my whole life. I mean, and, and it happened because I said something that I thought they heard, but they didn't. It's not they misunderstood me. It's that they weren't following me. Language is not ambiguous. We know what we're saying to each other. <laughs> uh, because there's a system, language is not ambiguous because it has a compiler. We have a compiler for ordinary language, like we have a compiler for Python or Java. Uh, so it's not ambiguous. It's not learned. It needs to be bootstrapped. I can give you so many examples that if it was learned, uh, it'll take the child uh, 50 years to resolve the references. We didn't get yet the quantifier score for 50 years just to resolve the references. Because the examples you need will be in the order of tens of millions, theoretically. Well, I don't think a child hears 60 million sentences in two years. Actually, this is more than the number of sentences the human hears all their life. I think I have the number somewhere. But is, isn't it, I mean, GPT-3 and BERT, there's a lot of work and a lot of information about it. You just said they're not even relevant to natural language understanding. No, there's no understanding. patterns they found. Can't we somehow reuse them? Yes, yes, what they do. And I, I tested GPT-3. I was lucky a friend of mine on, on my network invited me to evaluate with him and others. We tested it. I mean, look, what GPT-3 read millions and millions and millions of pages, all Google books, all Wikipedia, the internet, as far as I know, or, or most of it, basically lots of text. So it, it, and, and it created these pockets of memories of patterns of text. So it's a, it's a big memorization machine. It didn't memorize literally everything, although it can spit them out and they've done that but it memorized general patterns that, uh, uh, that there, so there are pockets in this network that has billions of parameters, meaning billions of weights. It, there are pockets where they have memorized the pattern that goes like this. Here, there's a pattern that memorized text that goes like this. So when you give it a prompt, it finds out the closest and it starts spitting out text that goes along with what you said from what it has seen before. So it's a big memorizing machine. It says, oh, I've seen something like this before. And it made sense to continue it this way. I'm going to spit that stuff out for you. And people say, it's generating text. No, it's dumping on you text that it saw before. That's it. End of story. But you know what? We have this culture of we like things. I mean, if you, it's not an accident that the most popular adjectives these days is big and deep. Big data, deep learning. There's nothing deep about learning, by the way, of today's learning. It's exactly the same model of the 80s, before you guys were born. It's just more computing power. So more layers, thus deep learning. It's the same model of the mid-80s, exact same model. Stochastic gradient descent to optimize, right, with back propagation. That's it. That is it. We, okay, we discovered a couple of activation functions that we didn't, we didn't use before. But okay, okay, that's it. But we like big and deep, and we like the fact that it's 150 billion parameters. It must be smart, man, because it's doing all that. It's unfortunate that science has 
come to this point. Really unfortunate. I mean, it's to the point where it's ridiculous, more guys. And now Google said, we'll up you. Now they're trillion friends. Like, okay, so you, somehow you're going to create intelligence if you keep stacking computers on top of each other. Excuse me? We like to worship big stuff and we like to believe that big is, is and grand is good, right? Like Elon Musk now, because he's wealthy, that means he's intelligent. By inference, if he's intelligent, I should listen to him, right? So if Elon Musk speaks about cheese, he's right. If Elon Musk speaks about uh, uh, influenza, he's right. If he, anything, Elon Musk is right now about any discipline or subject matter on earth because he's Elon Musk. He's wealthy, i.e. intelligent. Intelligent means I should listen to him. Or I'm not picking on Elon Musk. It could be Oprah Winfrey, right? Michael Jordan. Basically, this hero worship, big, deep. They're right because, hey, it's Google. You know, okay. <laughs> where did common sense go? Where, where did I mean, in, back in the days, right, people used to listen when it came to space to Neil Armstrong. Guess what? Because he's an astronomer. People, Albert Einstein was in, pop, in, in, in the media. Rockefeller was billionaire, but he never dared speak about science. Okay, you're a smart businessman. That doesn't mean you know physics. But we live in a culture where an article is written about something. They're right there. They don't listen to anybody else. Forget science. Forget common sense. GPT-3, billion parameters. Google, must be good. Done. This greed, this commercial. People now are proud if... Uh, I started seeing this phenomenon a long time ago, but I don't want to get, get into social uh, uh, issues now. But it's, it's fine. But it, it's related to this hysteria, to this, because common sense goes out of the window. I mean, I, I saw presentations by the so-called uh, God of deep learning, Godfathers of deep learning. And I look at some slides they had, and it's scientifically rubbish. Even scientifically. These are people that won an award, the Turing Award. They, they spit out stuff that is scientifically false. And you have, a, you have an army of young people taking like a sponge everything they say. That's immoral, man. That's even immoral. It's not only it's hurting science and it's going to even hurt AI or at a minimum delay AI, the real AI. But it's, it's ruining a generation of young people. You know how many messages I get privately? Believe me that. Okay, if I want to get to the real stuff, where do I start? Man, they're graduating with masters and PhDs. They have no idea what AI is. But you see the rest of it. 200 Coursera courses. And, and this commercial greed, by the way, that universities got into. You know, I can in one month make you an AI specialist. Berkeley, MIT. I don't, too late, I named names, but, I didn't, but, but the, the whole thing is disgusting in my mind. And the end is not going to be good. That's what I'm afraid because I lived through the first ugly period where it was taken over by commercial greed, by hackers. By, I mean, back in those days, I really sympathized with them. AI was such a new field. We didn't know much. We had to discover that it's not that simple. We trivialized many problems. Then we discovered they're complex. The field was new. But now, now you are uh, knowingly spitting out garbage just for commercial greed. There's no other reason. And the tech giants are perpetuating this paradigm. Guess what? Because the paradigm suits them well. I'm going to get you in trouble. Man. <laughs> People are going to say, how... Uh, uh, because it's a paradigm that suits them well. Lot, big data. Guess who owns big data? They do. Lots of computing power. Guess who has it? They do. So they love the whole paradigm, even if it's wrong. So it's like you feed me, I feed you. So they're, they're perpetuating a false paradigm that has nothing to do with AI. It's computational statistics, which is good in finding patterns in data in some domains, not even all of them. It's failing in health because it will easily do the wrong thing. It's failing. There are many debacles that happen and, and many scandals that happen that the whole thing didn't work. And so all of this because one deep learning network did better than others in recognizing cats. All this hoopla. 
I mean, it's unbelievable. In, in domains where it can predict using some, uh, it can do some predictions or forecasting because it's all lots of data. Fine, that's what it was done for. That's what computational statistics is all about. Great, right? But this is not AI. Look at self-driving cars. Billions went down the drain. And many years ago, back then, no one would listen. I said, this is not going to do it. We don't drive well just because we see the road. Vision is not what makes us drive well. Again, the proof is, put a four-year-old with perfect vision, they will not drive. Driving requires a lot of reasoning, complex reasoning. We're not conscious of it. We do reasoning. We adjust our plan in a fraction of a second, and we redo inferencing. This is about reasoning, guys. This is autonomous agents. What is a car? Okay, you call it autonomous driving, but it's an autonomous robot. It involves complex reasoning. It's not just about vision. Oh, we have deep networks that can recognize trees. Let's drive. My dog recognizes trees. Will you give him a car? I like the idea with the, with the primitive. So modeling out this common sense knowledge right. and this serving as a basis for natural language understanding. Now, Co common sense knowledge is a big word. There's common sense that we need for reasoning and stuff. But for language, no. Like an example is for language, I don't need to know that uh, if I keep... Uh, if, if I keep a block of ice in my hand, it will melt over time and how long it will take and all the physics. But common sense says if uh, you take uh, uh, an ice cube and you put it on ordinary temperature, it's going to melt because it's ice because it's below zero and outside it's not zero, so it's going to melt. But even that knowledge, you don't need for language. The common sense that you need for language is very superficial. Like I said, it's... Uh, it's, uh, if I say, uh, the, if you hear a waitress in the bar saying to the bartender, hey, Jim, the corner table wants another beer. The four-year-old knows. She means the people sitting on the corner table. Dad, come on. Tables don't drink beer. And tables don't have wants. Wants and tables don't want. They don't. So it's that type of knowledge. That's it. So, like it's, what I meant is it's not it's not technical knowledge like ice melts at zero degrees or whatever. no no even that is not needed a child doesn't know all that stuff so, so it's not even it's not even grade one knowledge it's it's knowledge that a child figures out when they're babbling around in the world and they figure out basic stuff and that's it well I'm still curious is there a need for hybrid AI for natural language understanding will this ontology of primitives be enough or do we need all these patterns that GPT-3 and, and so forth found? Outside of language, I also have an issue with the hybrid. You know, people when, you know, we're getting to a point now, uh, five years ago, it was all, even Jeff Hinton two months ago said, deep learning will eventually do everything. Oh my God, when I read that, I was like one back propagation algorithm that I can describe in 10 lines will describe all cognition. On its own, there's something wrong, but that's fine. I said, okay, uh, now they're mellowing down and they're realizing that, hey, this thing is not going to work. Man. I mean, we keep saying, give us more time, more training. I mean, we're reaching like, but no, this thing has been given trillions of, it's not, it's nothing called intelligence coming out of this thing. It's, a, it's just a big pattern recognition machine. So they climbed the tree so high, they need a ladder to come down without admitting failure. So the middle step is hybrid. Let's do hybrid. Okay. Maybe we should use some knowledge based stuff. Okay. Because they know they're not going to get anywhere. Self driving cars are losing billions. Uh, all the tech giants are putting hundreds of millions on language, nothing to speak of. If you talk to Alexa, you know what I mean. You, you might as well talk to your closet. And, you, and the, they're realizing it's not about more data. I mean, they have tons of data and they've been. Uh, they've been collecting data for, I mean, Amazon has every day probably 10 million, uh, uh, maybe more every day. Then they can save 10 million conversations every day. Uh, they have trillions. So it's not lack of data anymore. And they're not getting anywhere. So they're starting to say, okay, now there's a trend called uh, neuro, neuro, neuro Knowledge Graph. 
neural symbolic AI. Okay, so like I don't want to let go immediately. You know, it's like uh, uh, someone who just discovered that you know all that stuff in the Bible or in other holy books. Eh. But so they don't they they take uh, steps. They, you can't just dump everything you've been saying. And so you and now so the the most popular thing now is neuro symbolic hybrid. In my mind, and and hybrid uh, symbolic back then we used to call it connections. Same thing. We used to call it symbolic sub symbolic hybrid AI. Was a very active uh, area of research. Never completely died, but deep learning took over, and it was very popular. In my mind, it's a good step. But on the technical side, I, I don't think in the, uh, in the end it's going to be a hybrid. It's going to be a modular. So it's hybrid at the macro level, mm. that weird, but at the micro level, it's modular. In other words, there are tasks that we use 100% deep learning like technology. Believe it or not, ironically, I'm saying there are things that if you try to use anything other than deep learning like dash like technologies, you're an idiot. This technology, this task that we do is pattern recognition. This is a pattern recognition test. Don't try to use anything else. You will go nowhere. It's all about finding patterns in the lots of sensory input that we take. Okay? And hybrid doesn't work. But you have a module that is good at scene analysis, let's say. Let's say we have a module in the mind that's good at, vis at visual analysis. There's another module for reasoning and inferencing. Don't put pattern recognition there. So at the high, at, at the global macro level, it is hybrid. We do all kinds of stuff. Yes, we do, of course. We do probabilistic reasoning. We do default reasoning. We do deductive reasoning. It's proven. So there are modules, specialized modules. Each of it is not hybrid. It's specialized. This is a powerful pattern recognition machine there. The best. This is the best deductive engine you can ever find. They all work together in a hybrid way. But at the lowest level, it's not hybrid. There are specialized modules. The modularity of mind has been proven, by the way, a long time ago. First was imagined by philosophers. They argued for it. But it was proven, even neurologically, that you can you can just lose one skill in, like, dyslexic people. They're brilliant. But some, one module that does this is them. So when they say hybrid, they're also missing the point. There are powerful pattern recognition machines. There are powerful scene analysis because vision is not enough. We do reasoning and doing scene analysis, right? I mean, there's inferencing at the highest level in visual understanding. Okay, there, is a, there, there are machines. There are modules that are good in color interpretation. Only. There, are, there are modules that are good in sound and music. So, but each one of them is not hybrid. It's not all hybrid. Uh, I'll do everything. No. <laughs> there are things called uh, pattern recognition. There are things called deduction. There are things called uh, uh, priming in a semantic network. Get the general type of this semantic network module that is, they call it semantic memory. There are modules that are good at memory retrieval, long term, short term. All these modules work together. So at a very, very micro picture, macro picture, yes, it's a hybrid system. It does everything but it's made up of specialized modules. So I like to call it modular AI. Uh, the net result is a hybrid system. Yes, that you, and we do this. We know we do probabilistic reasoning. Sometimes you say, uh, what's, the, well, prob what's the likelihood? We do this. Sometimes we do default reasoning. We, we stereotype, we call it stereotyping. We, we reason by default, because I don't have time to uh, really validate this individually. So I. I generalize, we call it stereotyping. It's easier for the mind. We do all kinds of reasoning. We do analogical reasoning. I saw something that reminds me of another situation. Although it's new, it's not entirely new because there's an analogy to something else. It's called analogical reasoning. But individually, we have specialized modules that are not hybrid. Well, right. so uh, two, two final questions. First, well, what do you think, how far away are we from building systems that actually understand language 
And what example would be would be a proof for you that we're mm. there? Right. Uh, actually, language understanding is a very simple test that people try to avoid on purpose because they know how far they are from. Yeah, yeah. Of course. I mean, now you have these benchmarks for NLP squad, and these are this is a joke. That's not a benchmark for what? Uh, you, you create your own your own test data and you adjust your system to deal with your test data, and then you prove that you are good on your own data. It's like, excuse me? <laughs> no, uh, there's a first simple uh, way of testing language, actually. Uh, and it's not on NLP, NLU, which is another subject I've written a lot, but they are completely two different tasks. Uh, in NLP, the output is subjective. It's It follows the PAC paradigm of PAC learning probably approximately correct. The output of any NLP is probably approximately correct. Looks good. NLU is different. NLU is a binary decision. I understood. I'll get you the answer. Uh, so a good test is you, you take a database or uh, doesn't have to be relation. It could be a knowledge graph. Uh, and take my question, convert it to Sparkle or SQL and give me the answer. It looks complicated. Okay. It's simple. Okay, stop uh, blabbering and writing too many things. Benchmark, squad, blah, blue, uh, and millions of and and we beat them by 2.208 percent. And we're and and by the way, they've all been at 99 percent for 10 years. Right, so 99 percent, you should be able to answer a question. So the the real simple test is here's a database on let's say I don't know tourism, sightseeing in uh, uh, on uh, the uh, on the uh, Amazon jungle. Okay? That could be very finite uh, on uh, on Hollywood, right? Here's a database. Can I ask any question? Can you understand the one and only thought behind my question and get me the one and only one correct answer? Thank you very much. So everybody that keeps saying what, but, but how do we test? It's simple, man. I'm asking a question. The answer is in that database. Can you take my question, make it a SQL query, get me the answer and tell me the answer? If you can. By the way, big tech giants. I'm, so, I'm not going to name any anymore. Anyway. <laughs> one big one big tech giant. A few years ago, put a demo online. I think the database was something like uh, you're going to LA. You can ask questions about rental cars, hotels. Okay, I I am your tourist guy. This is what I know. I am a robot that knows tourism in LA. You can ask me anything. They took it out three four days later. Because people that because people that like them told them, hey, 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 guys, it answers one question by luck correctly and nine are wrong. Take it out. Because language understanding, zero degrees of freedom. You can't make one mistake. The the correct scoping wasn't done, the prepositional phrase. Just think of nominal compounds. You know, a plastic cup is a cup made of plastic. A plastic factory is not a factory made of plastic. It's a factory that makes plastic. Little things in language that people think, ah, it's a <laughs> uh, plastic engineer. There is a pla it's not an engineer that makes plastic. And it's not an engineer made of plastic. It's another meaning of plastic. It's an engineer that studied plastic. The point is they thought, oh, come on, it's all adjective nouns, but you no. Know, Language is not about adjectives and nouns. It's about what's underneath. So the test is simple. Stop making excuses. I'll give you the database. Can you get me the right answer? And that's the holy grail. That's what Bill Gates said. Uh, he said if he can see this capability, he would start a new company. And it will be bigger than Microsoft. 